Hey there, I am running a few minutes late. If you are joining me for just a little while tonight, I'm glad to have you and um, glad to be a friend to you. I don't know how many... I I understand There's there might be a uh, like a 30 second delay between the time I say something. If I, have, if I was to ask you a question... There might be a little bit of a delay, so I, which I wasn't aware of until, until I started doing live feeds. And hey, Roy, how are you? Hey, Lee Manners, what's up? I'm really glad you're here. I am. Uh, I have a really specific, hopefully kind of a penetrating uh, series of thoughts for you. And so I'm glad you're here. All the way on the West Coast. I said hi to your mom, I think, this morning or last night. And so uh, glad you're here. Um, I'm guessing, you know, I usually have to talk for a couple of minutes to make sure people know I'm here for as many as will be joining us. And, uh, hey, Evelyn, how are you? Bob, what's up? I see the maple syrup you guys are making. And, uh, do you get a discount if you're a friend? Or do I qualify as a friend? I don't know. I have to think about that. I hope everybody's doing really well. Uh, I honestly just hope that you're, uh, doing really well. Um, we're all trying to contend with what life is like now that we have a new friend in the coronavirus. <laughs> That's my dopey sarcasm. Uh, so I'm glad, uh, Pastor Larry, I miss you guys. I do. I'm glad that you are where you are, and I'm glad you're doing life out there in the West Coast. And I apologize for the glare on the glasses. I did everything I could other than take my head off to try to fix that the other night. So uh, I'll try to be... Sensitive to the fact it might look a little strange. I think if I tip my head down, I think, or up, whatever that is. Uh, I'm giving people a couple of minutes to join because what I wanted to do, hey, Hope, how are you? I, I am so glad that you're there. I really am. And just glad I'm waving to you. Uh, somebody asked me earlier, how did I wave? And what happens is there, I don't know if you're doing it or I do it, but there's a little green, white and green box that shows up and it says wave. So I just hit it and it Evidently, it sends you a, a wave. So, Colleen Nelson, what is up? How are you? Hope you're doing well. I see your pictures and your lovely art, and I just, uh, I'm very grateful. I, I am very grateful for art and people who make it and play music and do stuff. Um, hi, wifey. You're upstairs. And uh, we had a nice walk today. It was a beautiful day for a walk. We tried to stay away from everybody, and I hope you're doing the same. As unfriendly as that sounds, uh, what I want to get to is uh, in a few minutes. Hi, Clarice. How are you? Bonnie Lore, what is up? And uh, nice to hear from you. I'm glad you guys are doing well. And everybody, Haley says hi to everybody. Uh, I'm just waiting a couple of minutes. I, I have some uh, thoughts. And actually, they're not my thoughts, but they are a viewpoint uh, having to do with the fact that we, we read Scripture. I'm looking at a copy here. We read scripture, but God reads us, and uh, whether you want to use the word perceive, uh, interpret, whether observe, whatever word, I'm using the word read as a general word to describe the fact that we read black and white letters uh, in pages, and uh, Jason, what's up? I hope you're doing well. I'm sorry about all your shows getting canceled. You're not alone, though, Roddy. So now you got more time to practice. And so uh, <laughs> it's great to see you, too. You don't know how much you people mean to me. I, I, I mean that sincerely. Uh, I love, I just love the time that we spend uh, for whatever people are able to join us. And I'm looking at faces in it. Some of you I recognize and a few not. We've had some really nice visitors. Uh, from the West Coast. I thought that was you. I saw, Janet, I saw your picture pop up there. There's like these little round faces, and I can hardly make them out. So, uh, nice to see you. I hope you're doing well. Hope Talk is doing well there, doing all his academic work in a closet of all places. <laughs> so, you tell him I said hi, and tell him I'm trying to do something useful with myself. So if you join, I'm just killing like another minute or two to make sure there's some other people that uh, join us because I, I really do want to get to some, I'm not a healer. I don't claim any such capacity 
and I'm not a prophet uh, in the sense of a predictive prophet, although I have heard people use the word prophet for somebody who speaks for God. I don't, I don't have a problem with that at all. But if I use the word prophet, people think you're predicting the future, so I don't do that. Uh, not at all. Uh, but if you mean somebody who speaks for God, okay, I could, I could live with that, but that, that would mean that, uh, well, that's a conversation for another day. I, I wanted to get to some thoughts from what I like to call an Old Testament sonogram, uh, an Old Testament ultrasound. By the way, can you guys hear me? I'm, gonna, I'm asking the question, and I realize it takes a few seconds for, if you said yes right away, it takes a few minutes for that to float here. So I don't have any way really to check the audio that you're hearing. I've got it all the way up on my phone. But I think when I turn it on, uh, Facebook adjusts it automatically. So I'm assuming that you can uh, you can hear me. Um, so good. Anyways, I'm just going to get started uh, as usual. I get started and then uh, a little ways through, I kind of back up. Hi, Faye Wilson. What is up down there in the south? I hope you are behaving. And look what I got. Yes, I got a cup of coffee. See, some things never change. <laughs> some things never change. So, Sierra Lily, what is up? I am so glad you're here. Hope you get your couple of your brothers and sisters if they've got time to listen. Um, what I want to make sure that we're doing tonight is that we are uh, absorbing something together that is not just profound, but it's it's kind of simple. Uh, but it's it's very profound, and I think it has the capacity that, that what I want to get to has the capacity. Thank you, Hope. That is just really helpful. Uh, I was doing music this morning, and I had no idea if anybody could hear anything. I had two pianos and a guitar and a mandolin and whatever else going on. So I, I don't know if I'm playing tonight, but I did want to talk to you about something. Um, what what tr truth does... It, truth can sound like something that we want to do when we want to be more right than someone else that we dis disagree with. So if somebody says something to you and you don't agree and you go Google it or you go look it up and then you come back and throw it in their face. And that's not what I am talking about at all. There is a sense in which we are born into this world, obviously, but our, our experiences... Uh, you know what, John Denver sings that so much better, and I don't know if I have the voice for it. I haven't practiced that song in so long, so I, my wife told me you wanted to hear that, and uh, I, I got to work on that one. <laughs> I just got to work on it. What, what happens to our human existence, and if you're with me, I, I'm going to take parts of Psalm 139, so you can look that up in whatever version uh, you want. I am using my official... Uh, duct tape version, the DTV. It is taped, uh, it is glued, and it is whatever, anything just to hold it together. And I've got other Bibles, but sometimes when I'm talking to people, I like to pull out the old duct tape Bible, duct tape version, and I'll talk to people. When we are born, we begin to go through childhood and adolescence, our teen years and early life. What happens to us is we are introduced to our culture, our family, education, life experiences, books that we read, movies we watch, songs that we learn, the, the whole human existence. And a great deal of what happens to us may be good. It, it might be fine. Uh, but maybe some of what we learn is not so fine. And what happens to our, our philosophy, our sense of self, our sense of who God is, our sense of what our purpose is. Betty, I think that's you. Uh, just our sense of what life is all about. I thought that was you. Hi, Betty. Tell Jim I said hi. Hope you guys are behaving over there on the other street. What happens to us in the course of uh, our growing from childhood up is that we, uh, in, in cult, you, I can't hear you. I don't know what to do about that, sister. I, I have got it all the way up on my phone, and some people say they can hear. It's up all the way on mine, so listen louder. <laughs> it's, I got it up all the way, so... Um, hi Susan, how are you? Hope you're doing well. In in the pro process of maturation, as our thoughts develop, wherever there are, yes, Psalm 139, Psalm 139 to me reads like an Old Testament sonogram. It's like an ultrasound. It is a view 
of what God sees in us before we are born, while we are being carried, and even after after we are born. So that's why I wanted to spend a little while tonight uh, with you on, on this, because what I do believe is that as you grow up and you learn ideas and books and people and conversations and politics and music and whatever you watch for movies and whatever, what happens is any time you put into your mind, even by accident, misunderstandings, falsehoods, uh, uh, self-deprecating thoughts that are that are not true, what happens is you get separated from yourself. Uh, you imme- yeah, you immediately, not immediately, over time you get separated from who God knows you ought to be and who he would like you to be and maybe even who you want to be. But because of uh, misunderstandings, they're not always lies, but sometimes just misunderstandings that people have uh, about life, about politics, about your relationship to God, about the world, about nature, about fate, about destiny, about luck. It's all all kinds of things that can alter. Hi, Dory. How are you over there in, near Robinson? Oak, 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 Oakview, Oakdale, whatever that is. Oak something. And I, yes, I saw the... Donuts, uh, puns. We'll have to pick up on that later. What what happens to your sense of hi Ryan, your sense of who you are, your sense of who God is, uh, your sense of where you were headed in life. What what can happen is you pick up falsehoods, misunderstandings, half truths, and all of that affects your emotionality. In other words, if somebody said to you as a, as a child, you were a loser, it affects your emotionality. So then you have wrong thoughts, and then you have a, ra, wrong emotions. That makes sense to you? Um, you do not. You do not think so. So th- that that's why that's why the ability to see yourself the way that God sees you is is profoundly important, because not only it, you can have wrong thoughts about yourself, about your world about your relationships, your relationship to God, and even your relationship to yourself, you can have wrong thoughts or misguided thoughts. They can be lie. They can just be undeveloped thoughts. But whatever those are, they also have an effect on your emotionality. And that is why truth is not dormant. It is not just information for us to argue and try to win and be have a superior point of view. So if you're joining us... Um, you know, that's what I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at the reality. And when I say reality, I don't mean just better fact data than somebody else's fact data so that we can compete or even feel superior. I'm saying the the revelation that is in God's Word in this chapter reads very much like an ultrasound. Uh, in the Old Testament, they obviously didn't have ultrasounds, sonograms. So what you get in Psalm 139 is a sense. Of, I'm back. I lost you. If you get, if you're blank, it'll come back in a minute. I had a glitch here, so I'm assuming I am back up. Everybody, we good? Okay. I'm so unfit. I'm gonna keep rolling. It says I'm on. I had a glitch here and it was off, and then it came back on. So I'm assuming I am still here. One more time. I'm going to read some of these verses, and I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on the clock because I don't want to keep us here all night. But I, I do want you to experience, again, I was clear a minute ago, I'm not a healer. I do believe that God heals. But what I'm saying is that truth is it's not. It is not dormant. It, it does not have a lethargic uh, state attached to it. What truth does, truth it has an energy to it. Uh, I understand that a math equation, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and I understand that that's a fact, and that seems like it's a dormant fact unless you're just counting change. But truth, <clears throat> hey Beverly, how are you? What truth does, truth has embedded in it, it has an activity. It has a sense of activity for the mind and for the soul and, and for the emotionality. So when you begin to introduce truth into your thinking, you not only introduce truth into your thinking and into your values, into your world view, your view of self, your view of God, your view of your purpose. Hi, Nancy Miller. 
I miss you guys. You told Dr. John I said hi. Yeah, I got you. We're good. <laughs> That's good. Be careful out there. Um, what truth does is it does affect the mind and it does affect relationships and the, your worldview, your sense of purpose. But truth also engages itself in your emotions. And I think that's where we underestimate the power of truth. Beyond wanting to get our, our, our answers correct, our, our viewpoints correct. In other words, we want to get our view of self correct because we want to see ourselves. It's a really good goal. If you said my goal is to be able to see myself like God sees me, that's a really good goal. But in doing so, in seeing yourself, or more deeply seeing yourself, the way that God sees you, it changes, it, it gives life to your person. Because you stop seeing yourself as a biologic, as, as a somebody who was born at the better end of the gene pool. There is a magnificence and a, a present active tense to truth when you take it in, and the mind begins to muse on it and begins to hi, Aaron. Tell Brad I said hi. The, what happens with truth in the thinking is it doesn't just allow you to make better decisions or have a better view of yourself, and all of that is true. Truth not only teaches you to value other people and put them in a proper priority. You can't really respect people and value marriage and children and family and friends until you understand the truth of that. But again, and I know I'm overstressing this, uh, maybe, is that truth engages your emotionality in the depth of the soul. And that is why sometimes when you're reading scripture, and it's, it's, just, it's a unique experience, I do not believe that unbelievers can, can have or quite have the same experience that believers do. When you are reading a verse, you know that, that, that moment or moments when you're reading something and it just jumps off the page and you, and you kind of go, what? what did I just read? You know what I mean? That sense of almost lunging into the words. That is when the mind and the emotions are connecting in the presence of God. That's what that is. It's not just having a better idea. You are more deeply... Uh, appreciating and consuming and you're being transformed so if you got your Bible if, if you don't I'm gonna read these verses to you but what I want you to see I want to answer some questions but I, I, I have spent probably too much time telling you why I'm doing this and I usually don't but it's important to me that we get this what I want you to see is what God knows I want you to see where God is what God does and uh, if you don't mind the word think I'm gonna use the word think what God thinks uh, in the active sense. And I can give you some things that he doesn't like. All this in Psalm 139, 24 verses. So again, uh, I'm going to start with a, a verse, and I'd like you to listen to the first six. I'm just going to read you the first six verses. And I want to come back to the word know, as it relates, as the word know, K-N-O-W, relates to the person of God and you in his presence. Just bear with me. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. Uh, you know, when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. All my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you are familiar with it. Five says, you hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. That's an interesting phrase. And then he says in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Again, the the concept that we're looking at, if you're just joining us, is that as, a, as an illustration, uh, yes, Psalm 139, 1 through 6. Psalm 139 in its entirety reads, I don't want to say x-ray because that's just too black and white and that just looks kind of like <laughs> too skeletal. Is that a word? Uh, it's more like an ultrasound. What you and I, yeah, the word no. In the Hebrew, it's the word yada. And if you look at verse 1, you find the word no. If you find in verse 2, the word no. In verse 3, the word discern. In verse 4, the word no. Um, in fact, in verse 5, he uses the word hem, 
but it's the sense that God is hemming in somebody that he knows. And then in verse 6, hey, David, what's up? Um, he uses the word knowledge, and he says it's too wonderful. So what you find embedded, what you find embedded in, in, in those verses, the Hebrew word yada, is that God knows, but it is an active knowledge. It is a penetrating knowledge about you. Uh, maybe that makes you feel unnerved. I don't really know because nobody knows you. Uh, <clears throat> nobody knows you like God knows you. Again, that's verse 1, you know me. Verse 2, you know. Verse 3, you discern. Uh, be verse 4, you know it completely. Uh, you hem me in. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. And the idea here that the psalmist is conveying is not that God has all the fact data in the world, like he's memorized the names of every, everybody and all the animals and where all the stars. I got that. That's true. But that is not what he's addressing here. The psalmist, in his use of the word knowledge, is, is talking about what God knows in relationship to him as an individual. Hey, Renee, tell Scott and Ryan I said hi. So the concept here, is that God knows. And let, let me take this, uh, yeah, I hope you do. Um, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha you on the word omniscient and omnipresent. And we like those 90 cent words because because they give us a sense of omnipresence is God is everywhere. Omni, uh, omnipotent is his power and uh, omniscient is his knowledge. But in, in this sense, God knows. In the first six verses, hey, hey, Brian, what's up? God knows the one that he has created, and he knows how he created. Do you remember when I got started, I told you that knowledge, coming into knowledge, allows you to know who you are. And this is what is important. God knows the person that he created, even when we don't know ourselves. Let me say that again. God knows the person, the man, or the woman, the boy or the girl. I could care less what the eth it doesn't matter what the ethnicity is or the age or the social upbringing or the social background or the educational depth. God knows you and what he wants you to do is to a little bit at a time come into the knowledge of yourself that he has. Does that make sense? God wants you and I to grow in the knowledge that he has of us as individuals in our purpose and his will for us. When I use the word not when he uses the word knowledge, the word yada, it is active, it is penetrating, and it's life transforming and it's it's comforting because it means that God is leading you. This is really important. God is leading you and providing for you not only in the depth of his knowledge, but in the knowledge he has of you. He knows you, and he knows how he created you, and he knows how he wants to relate to you. That is why it is so important for you to grow in this knowledge, that you come into his knowledge so that you can learn more about who he made you to be. Now, let me go back to the word knowledge here for a minute. I want to try to juxtapose the knowledge of God with your knowledge or mine. There is no sense in which God has been taught to gain his knowledge. There's no sense in which the Lord has to experience through mistakes to gain his knowledge. There is no sense in which God was discipled by somebody to acquire knowledge. I know this is going to be hard for you to grasp it's impossible for me to grasp in its fullness, but we can grab some of it. God has always been omniscient. Okay? Now think about that for a minute. Because I'm going to give you one other phrase. Hey, Rhonda, how are you down there in Texas? I'm going to give you another phrase. Okay? Uh, I learn through reading, through listening through life experience, maybe through books, by mentoring others, by watching how others... I, we, you and I learn in all kinds of, of ways. God does not learn that way because he's omniscient. 
He has always been omniscient. Are you ready for the next one? <laughs> I'm just telling you, this one's deep, and I, I'm not going to stay here, but I just want you to know that. God is omniscient, and he knows himself perfectly. I just, I don't understand anything omnisciently. <laughs> God is omniscient, yet he knows himself perfectly. He knows himself fully. That's, God is, if you don't mind, he is self-aware. He is aware of his own omnipotence. He is aware of his own immutability. He doesn't change. Uh, his, uh, all of his, his holiness, God understands his holiness. You and I are trying to figure these things out. We are learning. God does not learn in that sense. He knows. And he knows that he knows himself. And he knows that he knows you. And that is why there's such comfort in these first six verses. They weren't meant to be absorbed so that we had memory verses and so we could kind of maybe know some things we didn't used to know. It's, I, I get that. I get the fact that we want to learn. But beyond the, 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 I, the fact that, I, I almost hate to use that because it's just, it's divine revelation. It's not only revelation that God knows you, but you are learning that God knows himself and he knows the way that he made you and that should give you deep assurance in how God wants to relate to you and as you walk with him those things that you learned in grade school junior high high school in your married life in your business those things that I mentioned to you a few minutes ago that that alter the way that we think because we pick up a lot of falsehoods about ourselves, about our worth about how we fit in how about, hey, Andrew Smith, what's up? We pick up a lot of uh, wrong, if you want to call it, information about life, about God, about self, about self-awareness, about our relationship to our own place under the sun in, in the world. And what truth does, the, the Hebrew word yada, that's what we're looking at in Psalm 139, what truth does is it not only in it, it not only broadens the mind and not only gives you a clear focus, a sense of real, if you don't mind the word vision, I don't mean that in the sense of spooky vision, in the sense of clarity, in the sense of clarity, and the sense of personal illumination, 1 John 2.27. It's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. What these verses tell you is that God knows, he knows you in a very penetrating, personal, caring way, but God, who is omniscient, knows himself completely. And the, the counsel for this, the comfort for this, and I, I'm hoping that you are grasping, as, as, no matter where you are in your Christian faith here, I hope you're grasping the fact, if God, and he does, that's a rhetorical if, if God knows himself completely, even though he's omniscient, then that means he knows you perfectly if god has the capacity to know himself completely and he's omniscient then the care and the comfort and the leading and the conviction and the provision and the love that god has for you hey tristan means that he does that with a perfect knowledge of you for those of you who are joining we're looking at psalm 139 i am likening it I am likening Psalm 139 to an Old Testament. Hey, Danny, what's up? I think you went to Florida. Last I knew you were headed from Maine to Florida, so good for you. <laughs> Less snow down there, <laughs> I think. Um, so that's what you get the first six verses. It's deep, but it, it attaches itself. When you, there's so much here, really there is. When Psalms, 39.1 says, you know me. Why does he know you? Does he have to? Is he obligated? Are you making God know you? What, what the knowledge of God about you tells you is that he's interested. There's a passionate, personal interest in you. Uh, two says, you know when I sit and when I rise. Why does he care? Why, why would he want to know that? I'm serious. How many people in your life do you want to know when they get up and when they sit down, when they go to bed? I mean, seriously, how many people do you really want to know that about? He does. That's what David said. You know when I sit. Really? Yeah. <laughs> he really does. You know when I rise. 
He knew what time I got up, what time I went to bed. He knew which Bible verses I was listening to when I went to sleep last night, right? It's interesting. Uh, three says, you discern my going out and my lying down. Now think about this for a minute. Uh, I think I mentioned this the other day, and I'm going to pronounce the word derek, D-R-K. It's, it's a Hebrew word for a path or, or a way. A way is a path. It's a path made by continual use. If you had a, a neighbor who lived next door, and you were really friends, and you went back and forth you know, with each other's lawn, you would make kind of a path by continual use. God is familiar with all of your paths, your thought patterns, your emotionality, your ha good habits, your bad habits, what you avoid, the, uh, everything. Well, why? But see, see all, of the, all of the knowledge in the first six verses back in the question, why? Why does he want to know? Why is he interested in all this? Uh, forces before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. Why? <laughs> I, there's so much information going on, on around me. Sometimes it's like I'm going, I, and too much TMI. I, I, I mean, really, I, I hope you don't mind me putting it this way because I'm just a guy trying to convey some truth here. But there's no TMI with God. He's interested in all of it. And he has the capacity to absorb it. I mean, I don't just find this informational in the sense I feel better about my thoughts now. I find this addresses my emotional needs as well. And I think that is where a great deal of church has missed. We Sometimes we do really good on theology, but we just do not connect it to the real warp and woof of life, the real embedded nature of life. Hi, hey, Greg and Teresa, how you doing? We are looking at Psalm 139, if you're just joining us. And in, in, in 6, when you, when you get to 6, you get a, a, something of a, a narrative statement. And his, it's, it doesn't have the word worship or praise attached to it, but it is a worshipful thought. Because the expression in verse 6 is rooted in the first five verses. And he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me too lofty for me to attain. Um, in some sense, it's related to Paul's comment that if a man thinks himself to know something, he doesn't know it like he ought to. Uh, it's not really the same, but in that sense that trying to absorb all of this sometimes can feel like you're trying to put Niagara Falls in a coffee cup. You can get some of it, but you can't. It starts spilling over. And I think that is where I want to Stop right here at verse 6 before we go on forward. Again, if you're just joining us, we're talking about knowledge. But we're not talking about knowledge as fact data, as dormant, as lifeless, as lethargic. We're talking about knowledge as penetrating, almost overwhelming, the overwhelming presence of God. This invasiveness, it's, it's unapologetic. It comes with no warning. Just the absolute freedom, the sovereignty. You don't find the word sovereignty in, in those six verses. But it's all over it. You can't escape it. It's, this is the Father's world. And we belong to Him. We are created by Him. And whether you are in Christ or not, He knows that. That is why the unbelievers and believers, unbelievers are not going to blend in. You, you have to come to Christ and receive Christ as Savior, and he knows that. And the frightening reality is at the end of the age, he will say, depart from me, because I never knew you. He knew about you, he knew your thoughts, he knew your life, he knew your words, but he never knew you in terms of relationship. And I, and I just want you to know, if you are a saved person, you are known. You aren't just known about as a number. You are known by a God who cares, who dotes over you who cares about you, who's not committed to you. And this is what I, I want you to grab this. The Father is not committed to you as a believer because he has to be. It's because he wants to be. But why does he want to be? What is it that God wants to know? Sorry you got to go, buddy. I think it'll, I'll, I'll put this on the YouTube. I'll put it on YouTube or something so you can watch it later if you want. Why does God want to know? The short answer to that, it's, it's not the best answer to it, but the short answer to that is because he loves us. And that's a great answer, and I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. We tend to think that God's love for us is all about us. Yes, and that's a scary thought. 
But there's something deeper. Hey, Jane, how are you? Down there in, I think, Forest, Virginia. There's something deeper about the Father's love that I think we misunderstand or maybe don't think about at all. The Father loves you because it brings Him glory. It's not a self-serving glory. It's not a, a, a cosmic narcissism. There's nothing more pure and more right and more holy and more wonderful, more sweet, more lovely, more radiant, more magnificent than the glory of God. And God loves you because His love brings Him glory. His love for you as an individual is true. and Nothing can separate you from the love of God. But the reality is he doesn't just love you because you're lovable. He loves you because it brings him glory. Which means the Father loves you. It brings him glory. And the knowledge of this immediately escalates your worth without you sitting around trying to make your own self-worth. You and I have worth. It's embedded in those six verses in Psalm 139. We bear the Imago Dei. We bear the image of the living God. That could mean body and soul. Maybe some believe uh, man is dichotomous. Some believe man is tri, three-part, body, soul, and spirit. I believe after you come to Christ, you are at least trichotomous, body, soul, and spirit. In any case, that's for another day. The reality is those six verses about the knowledge of God are important to you. They're important to your health and your well-being and their sense of purpose. And we enter into you. We enter into his love, but we also into the, the sense of the radiance of his glory. That's the first thing. What does God know? Now, I wanna, I'm going to move this along. Okay. Where is God? This is an Old Testament sonogram. I want to read you verses 7 through 12, and I want to try to answer, where is God? We're having this... Uh, Terrible bout with coronavirus. And I'm sure by the millions, I don't think that's an understatement. People are asking, where is God? So I'm going to read you these verses. I'd like you to listen. I'd like you to listen to the questions. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heaven, that's a rhetorical question. If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I rise on the wings of the morning, nice poetic phrase there. If I settle on the far side of the sea, listen to this, verse 10. Even there, which is, that's his way of extreme, even there, as far away as you can imagine, as far up as you can imagine. Even there, your your right hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. There are two important, they are, 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 are earthy, they are strong verbs, they are all elastic verbs here, and you, you can't miss these. Don't miss these. It is the word guide and the word hold at the end of verse 10. Don't, don't miss this. Now, verse 1 through 6 talks about what God knows. Verse 7 through, let's call it 12, and let me read those other two verses. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, and the light will shine as the day, for the darkness is as light to you. It is, it is impossible for the human mind to be in a place where God cannot read it. And that is why I, I, the note I put on Facebook earlier said that we read Scripture, but God reads us. Hi, Beth. How are you? Up there in Cannesburg, I think. Um, the note I put on Facebook earlier, just as kind of a heads up that I would be doing this, was we read scripture, 66 books, 1,189 chapters, 31,170 verses, whatever. We read scripture, okay, but you are being read by God. Not as source material, but you are being observed the Father has his eyes on you and his heart attached to you. And he has his person attached to you 
but the verse six, first six verses tell you they are attached by way of penetrating omniscient personal knowledge. If you're just joining us, I said earlier that God knows, He knows you, He knows you perfectly. And the assurance, the reassurance and the healing from that is God is omniscient and He knows Himself perfectly. He knows himself perfectly. If he knows, and he does, knows himself perfectly, he knows you perfectly, and he knows how to provide for you, how to convict you, how to lead you, how to transform you, what he wants you to become. And coming into knowledge allows you to become the person that he wants you to be, which means sometimes you have to figure out who you're not. Where are the false identities? Where are the false truths? Where's the false morality? And, and that's why we're looking at this now. We're talking now, the second thing we're talking about is where is God? Why does that matter? Because... Um, for those of you who know me, I probably have said this one more time too many times, but you just cannot confuse how life makes you feel with how God feels about you. Okay? How do I know that? Because I'm looking at an Old Testament ultrasound. And in verse uh, 8, uh, 7, he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your spirit? Uh, from, your, from your presence. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that the psalmist says, there's no place that I can go where you wouldn't know? But why would God want to know? Why would God want to know everywhere that you go and everywhere your thoughts go, everywhere that your emotions go? Why would he want to know that? Because again, he does love you, and he loves you because it brings him glory. The most pure, most righteous, most wonderful thing in all the universe is the glory of God. Hi, Jordan. So when you get to verse 8, it's, it, is a, it is a rhetorical question. If I go up into the heavens, you are there. Although, there's a couple of prophets that took a trip up there and came back to talk about it. <laughs> right? Okay. And he said, if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Now think about this for a minute. Jonah was taken down into the depths. In, in, in a similar way, Joseph, not in the depths of water, but Joseph was taken down into the depths of a dungeon. Daniel was taken in the depths. Jeremiah was taken down into the depths of despair. At one point, he was so, he's so discouraged, he said to God, you tricked me, you fooled me. But part of our, our human experience is we get into the depths of certain emotionality. You just can really tank. I mean, you can just lose your way. Even spiritual people, I, I wish we would stop putting smiley faces on people's pain. And I, I do, I do like certain verses in the Bible. I like Romans 8, 28, but it just doesn't answer certain questions. And when I read through Psalms, there are honest, passionate, poetic um, d displays of anger and frustration and wondering where God is and why do the wicked seem to rule. Just the whole human condition. Even in the the, uh, the the angst, I'm not sure that's a big word with me, but even in our frustration and our, our sense of being separated from ourselves, God is never, he never experiences that. He never, our, our Lord, our creator, our master, our shepherd, our king, our, our savior, our refuge and our rock, he has never spent one millisecond separated from who he is. Me, on the other hand... <laughs> If you're honest with yourself, you have moments where you kind of go, ay, 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 I mean, have, I, have I lost my marbles? Right? We all have that, but God does not have that. He does, and I, and I won't do this tonight, what we are neglect to teach is that God does have emotions, and um, they are written about, and they are highlighted in very passages which tells you i think that's part of our, our our makeup part of our being made in his image is is the fact that we can identify with him and he identifies with us in, in emotional ways in this psalm in verse 9 he said if i rise on the wings of the dawn or go to the far side of the sea god is aware of that and that means wherever your debt is financial debt is wherever you're struggling with relationships right now Wherever your academic limits or successes are, your career successes or failures, your ministry hits and misses, whatever our parenting hits, miss, hits or misses, <clears throat> this is what is really a significant. God, in a very invasive way, invites himself into wherever you are 
relationally, professionally, emotionally, spiritually, culturally. No matter what age you are, the Lord himself, as we saw in the first six verses, he is able to penetrate willingly with his love for his glory wherever you happen to be. That is why your prayers do not fall on deaf ears. It's, it's impossible. God may choose not to answer them when and how you would like, but he might surprise you, right? That's where God is. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient and he is omnipresent. But those are not just 90 cent theological words. Those were meant to engage our hearts and souls, our lives, our minds, our relationship, and our prayers, our songs, our lives, and what he knows and where he is. Third thing uh, I want you to see is in, in verses 13 through 18. And I'd like you to, let's take a break. Just take a break for a minute. Just shake it, just breathe, do something just for a minute. Because what, I'm, what I want to show you is what God does. And I want to do this in a way that's personal. So just maybe stretch your head and let me get a swig of coffee before I knock it off the bench. Hope you're doing well. Hi, Naomi. What is up down there in the south? Hope you're doing well. You guys wash your hands. Wash your mouth out if you need to. Right? Okay. We are talking about Psalm 139. Yep. We are going to be in verse 13 through 18. I don't really feel like I'm, I'm teaching this. I guess maybe I am. But we're talking. That's really what I wanted to do in these. Just I just I thought it would be better for me to sit here. I'm in my basement. I got a music stand. I got my pianos all around here and guitars and stuff. And we're just we're doing scripture. I, I'm a pastor. I have been. I came to know Jesus uh, 43 years ago in a sportsman's club, which you would remember. Maybe Naomi, some of your family would. Um, and so here we are, 43 years later, talking about. What God knows, where God is, and he's everywhere, and uh, what he does. If you're just joining us, I apologize for those of you who are here. I'm trying to make sure we don't lose anybody here. We talked from verse 1 through 6 about what God knows. We looked at verse 7 through 12, what, where God is. We talked about the fact that God knows and knows himself. He knows himself perfectly, so he knows you perfectly. And how's Sarah? How are you? Um... Uh, we talked about we talked about the fact that God is omniscient and he knows himself perfectly. And if God who is omniscient knows himself perfectly, it means he knows you in a very penetrating way, knows everything about you. So his leadership and his provision, his correction and his love, his care, his plan, and everything about you is done according to the way that he knows you. And he would love you to enter into his knowledge, the knowledge that he has of you. God would love you to enter into the knowledge that he has of you so that you and he can be on the same relationship. Somebody said that God would love to talk to you where you are if you would just show up. Because Sometimes we're so busy trying to be somebody else or who we think everybody else wants us to be that we sort of lose sight of who we are. All right. I want to talk about the third thing, which is what God does. And I'd like you to... I'd like you to concentrate on the verbs here. Uh, again, I'm a real believer that we meet with God between the commas. We absorb truth like you sip hot tea, like you enjoy like just small bites of carrot cake. So what we're going to look at from verses 13 through, let's call it uh, 18, are small, boy, small bites of theological carrot cake. I have no idea if that's a good analogy. I hope you like carrot cake. I don't care if it's brownies, whatever it is, just small bites here. So I want you to follow along in this Old Testament sonogram about you. This is an Old Testament sonogram that has you as a focus. And as this Old Testament sonogram further in unfolds, we find the following statements, and listen to the careful, not just the carefulness that's described, but the carefulness in which this is written. For you, speaking of God, you created my inmost being. Stop. Everybody, stop. Call a friend. Grab that phrase. You are going to need that phrase in the first six verses, because if you will listen to me, 
I, I, I almost got tears in my eyes. Hi, Jessica. I, I do. I'm, I almost have tears in my eyes. I wish I had known for the first 30 years of my Christianity what I'm about to tell you. I wish I could have grabbed it in my mind, in my busyness. Verse 13 said, you created my inmost being. Back to the first six verses. You know me. You search me. You know when. You discern. You know it completely. God created in you. He created your inmost being. He not only created your inmost being, but he knows your inmost being that he created, and he loves your your inmost being. Not the phony self, not the one that was created out of peer pressure, not the maybe the unfortunate one that was created in your mind out of parental pressure, sibling pressure, cultural pressure, whatever it is. No, no, no. God knows your inmost being, and he loves your inmost being, and he wants to reveal your inmost being to you. We're separated from ourselves a little at a time through childhood, through adolescence, through adulthood, because of pressures and bills and politics. We, I, we give ourselves false identities, right? But he loves you. That is why that verse, you created my inmost being. And he needs a way to describe the process. So rather than do it, scripture isn't a biology book. So here's what he said. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I was knit together. You were knit together. It wasn't sloppy. It wasn't random chance plus time. It wasn't fate. It wasn't karma. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't evolution. The, finger, the fingertips, the almighty loving, omniscient, first six verses, omnipresent, next six verses, fingertips of the Lord Almighty knit you together in your mother's womb. He knit your body together, your structure together, and your inmost being. And your inmost being was created because he loved your inmost being, and he desires to have you be a conduit for his glory. There's no greater accomplishment in your life than for you to come into the reality that the Father wants to have you be a conduit for his glory. And that can only be done through Jesus. Not through church, not baptism, not works, not competition, not religion, not uh, tipping the scales, all that. Not through an experience. Through Jesus Christ, you come into his knowledge and you come into the ability to become who you are and to allow God to let you become a conduit for his glory. And there's no greater purpose in your life than that. No greater purpose than his glory. All right? It's the sweetest, most lovely thing. Not only does he say, you created my inmost being, my mother womb. How, how good a job did God... Okay, now listen to me. Are you, are you listening? I almost want to grab you. <laughs> okay. I want to grab you by the shoulders and listen to me. All right. With the, the comprehension that he was created, the inmost being was created by the Father. With that comprehension... His, his own um, re response is a worshipful resp response. It's not arrogance, but he says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That is a response to verse 13 that says, you created my inmost being and you knit me together in my mother's womb. And then his response to that own, that own illumination is, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. There is absolutely no reason why you should be sitting around punishing yourself because you aren't what somebody else told you you ought to be. You might have sinned, and you might certainly need the Lord's forgiveness. That's what Jesus provides. But the sense of your essence, the essence of your being, when David looked at that, he said, I praise you because I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. There's the word no. He knows, and that's why verse 14 to me goes back to the first six verses, because David knows what God has know, knows, and God has shown David what he knows, and it has become, David, it has become 
David's knowledge. Please don't let that run past you. I, I hope that didn't sound redundant. When you get uh, to 14, and he says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And he says, I know that full well. That is the psalmist. Ah, sissy. My sister's here. Love you to pieces. And uh, tell Kathy and Mama I said hi. Just trying to do something for the Lord here. Hope it's productive. <laughs> when David says, I know that full well, how did David come into that knowledge? Where did he learn that from? You see, God had taught David what David knew. And David is responding to the knowledge, not just the knowledge of who God is, but who God created David to be. And he says, I know that full well. And his response to knowing himself was worship, not the worship of self that is currently taught in our 20th and 21st century. The sense of we have almost we have come back to the Greek mentality. I've taken courses, courses on Greek philosophy and Greek history and Greek architecture, architecture and Greek art, Greek politics. And it's all wonderful. It's all interesting. And they were just completely obsessed with self. They even had a series of gods that were just bigger versions of themselves. That is not what we are talking about. When David began to grow in the knowledge of who God created when God created David, and he began this self-aware, it wasn't a self-awareness that led to conceit, and uh, narcissism, narcissism and, and vanity or pride. David's response to the knowledge of himself was to recognize who God made, and his expression was to praise God. Look who God made. But it had nothing to do with David. David didn't praise himself. He didn't even mention any of his attributes, at least here. What David is praising is the fingertips of God at work, and he understands the glory of God is, is, is what we are talking about here. In fact, 15 says, now this is more uh, where uh, 13 talks about my inmost being. 14 talks about physicality. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Um, you're getting verbs here. Remember I told you the verbs were very kind of hands-on verbs. So you have words like created in verse 13. Let's call it 13a. 13b, you have a word like knit. And you can imagine, you ever watch somebody knit? I, I don't even understand it. I mean, I, I, I can't even stand to watch it. It's, it's like, it make, I, I can't, it's so, I, I would go mind-numbingly. I just couldn't sit that long. I could not sit that long. That is nothing compared to the intricacies with which the Father placed you together. Think about this for a minute. The psalmist uses the word created. Uh, let, me, let me back up, and I'm trying to make this not last all night. When you open your Hebrew Bible, the very first phrase you find in Hebrew is Bereshith bara Elohim, in the beginning. In fact, the book of Genesis in Hebrew is Bereshith, but the first activity that you get it's, it's like a thesis statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Same word. God, God created. Whatever God created on day one, day two, day three, day four, he said it is good. And that is the sense here. I, I understand that we're not talking about perfection here. But still we're attributing my existence and your existence to where it ought to be attributed. And that is to God. Not fate, not random chance, not evolution. David said, uh, my, my, I was created, I was knit. I was made. Uh, I was woven together. It's a patient, deliberate design, uh, a, a sense of purpose. Uh, that is where everything that you have ever struggled with, and I, I almost think everything that you've ever struggled with, with self-doubt and self-worth, is so answered in this ultrasound. Because your self-doubt, you have self-doubt, and self-loathing and sometimes hatred of self because you have not entered into the knowledge of what God knows about you and who he made you to be. If you understood, really understood, who God made you to be, your response would have to be worship, not worship of self, of worship of God for, because of who he made you to be. It's not arrogance. It's not conceit. It's the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all is that God individually, 
with all the billions of people that have walked planet Earth, he took the time to make you, form you, fashion you, knit you, stitch you, plan you, love you, purpose you together for his glory. When you are filled with hate, self-loathing, it means you have separated yourself from the person God made you to be. Because if you really understood that, you wouldn't hate yourself. You'd be awestruck, not at yourself for vanity's sake. You'd be awestruck at who God is. Does that make sense? You'd have to be. There's no way that you can go out on a starlit night and watch the, the radiance of stars, watch a shooting star, Sometimes the shadows that the stars make. There's no way that that's not breathtaking. The wonders and the, the translucence of, of a rainbow. I saw a double rainbow once. It was double rainbow because it was reflecting in a lake and I was in a canoe and it was just like this giant circle. It was awesome. It was a double rainbow. It was awesome. But a rainbow cannot acknowledge the presence of God in an intellectual way. A tree can't. The stars don't. Halley's Comet doesn't. Ecosystems don't. Beautiful canyons. I love the trees out west. Love the mountains. Love them. I love the seas. I love the, the sting on my face from salt air. But the oceans don't pray. You got that? You can and I can. We can know him. We are the only part of the entire universe that were fashioned in the image of the living God. And we were meant to be awestruck by what God did. We should find our value in that. Because in doing so, it's a revelation of who God made us to be. And you ought to protect that. You ought to nurture that. You ought to care for that. And if you get this, you know what? This, this is the greatest, and I'm a little political, political here, but it fits. This is the greatest answer to racism. It, it is. It's the, greatest, it's the greatest medicine in marriages, when you realize the person that you're living with was made by the same God who made you, when two people in a home understand this, you can make things work. You want to resolve things. You know why you want to resolve them. Because the person that you're married to is so fabulously priceless. But they aren't priceless because they're married to you. They're priceless because they have been made by God. That's why they have value. That's why your children have value and worth. And that is where the emotionality of all this comes into play. I love my wife, Kathy. We don't always see eye to eye. Not really. But I still love her because I see in her the handiwork of the living God. And that's why I love the people in our church and the people that I bump into. I love the people on my Facebook thread who post all kinds of nonsensical, crazy things I don't even identify with. It's so far out there. But, you know, I think it's not why I love them. I don't love them because they're pro this or anti that. It's, just, it's so it's crazy. I love them when I put the gospel and devotionals on Facebook because I know God made them. I know God wants to redeem them. You see, this is where healing, real healing comes into play. Where God is, verse 1 through 6, um, I'm sorry, what God knows, verse 1 through 6, where God is, verse 7 through 12, what God does. And uh, I'm going to close here in just a second. Um, there is an equal serious uh, part of this I want to get to in a second. Um, I think it's interesting, verse 17 and 18 say, how precious to me are your thoughts. How does he know that? How does David know that God's thoughts are that many. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. How does he know that? How does David know that the thoughts of God are precious and vast? Those Remember I told you we meet with God between the commas. The thoughts of God in the mind of the psalmist are of both priceless, they are precious, and they are vast because they can only be divinely revealed. But when you understand the first six verses that are up there, you understand why precious and vast matter. Because the verse six verses tell you what God knows, how he knows it, why he knows it, where he knows it, how often he knows it. When you get down to verse 17 and 18, he's reflecting on that same bit of theology and emotionality. Do not forget that theology wraps itself around emotionality. Don't ever forget that. And the lack, 
the lack of accurate biblical teaching. The lack of it separates you from your emotionality. You become completely emotionally unhealthy when you allow yourself to be separated from the mind of God. And the mind of God is revealed mostly in His Word through the revelation and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And what you find is healing, genuine emotional healing as you come closer to God and His truths become yours. It isn't hostile truth. It isn't cold fact. It isn't being more right than others. It's, 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 uh, it's understanding that God's truth becomes your truth and you are healed in body, mind, and soul by it. And it heals relationships that you have with other peace, people because you stop holding them emotional hostage. For something that they aren't the empathy grows inside of you because you understand other people are struggling too but you can understand intrinsically who god made them to me um in verses uh he says when i awake i'm still with you in verses 19 and 20 he says that you would slay the wicked and, and the bloodthirsty and that they would they, they speak evil uh, against you. Hey, how are you, Tracy? How are you? Uh, and he talks about your ad, your adversaries misuse their name, and uh, and he says, "Do not I hate those who uh, uh, hate you?" And he's very clear on that. And he says, "I have nothing but hatred for them." And, and 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 that almost sounds like it ought to be in another psalm, but it's embedded in this psalm because, and and, and I'm so, I'm so glad you're joining us. If you if you haven't been here. I'm so glad that verses 19 through 22 were there. In the first couple of decades of my Christian life, I, I did not, and maybe even more, I did not understand how those verses fit. But here's why. Um, the truth of God, not just cold theology, but the, the personal revelation of God in the mind and in the emotions and in the soul, they heal you. They heal your sense of self and they create proper expectations for who you ought to be. And they, they emotionally heal your truth and emotions fit together. And they create a healthy, wholesome person. And that allows you to be a healthy, wholesome person with other people. When you look at verses 19 through 22, words like hate show up. And you're going to, what? What is it? Because anything that stands opposed to the revelation of God's truth stands also in the opposition of his love and his healing and his glory. It isn't a, and that's where those verses get misunderstood. Those are not personal descriptions of personal hate. We would say hate speech, but they aren't. What he hates there is the fact that the enemies of God speak falsehoods. They speak corrupting truth. They have a corrosive effect on themselves and everybody around you. Why would anybody love that? You can love a person, but really despise the fact that they are anti-God in their speech. Nothing will separate you from your children faster than falsehood. Nothing will separate you and create a coldness in a marriage faster and in a more traumatic way then falsehood, because when you gain a false perspective of who you are and who they are, you, you begin to separate yourself, maybe more than you realize, from the parts of truth that create real healing. Remember, we are uh, broken people. We all say that. But the healing, emotional healing, relational healing, spiritual healing, self-healing, peace with self, being able to sleep at night, hey Connie, uh, sleep at night is created when the mind absorbs the revelation of God's truth in a way that is not just academic. Sitting through a Sunday school class where you're just keep looking at the clock. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the revelation of who God is and the revelation of who you are. There's a word we use called hermeneutics. It's, it's proper Bible and interpretation. And the idea is to interpret what it says, what it means, how it applies, and how it fits in. Whether you look at it that way or not, I don't know. But that's really the way this works. Good observation, 
leads to good interpretation, leads to good application, how it fits into the broader scope of things. God's truth in those six verses tells you what he knows and how he knows it and why he knows it. But he, he wants to know you if you're just joining us. And that's why those verses towards the end, 19 through 22, talk about why he hates the enemy because they represent falsehood. They represent the antithesis of the goodness and the glory and the wonder and the healing and the love and the progress and the purpose of the living God in your life. The living word from the living God gives life. Now, I want you to think about that. I'm going to recap this at the end if you're just joining us. Just keep this in mind. It's a good phrase if you want to keep that. The living word from the living God gives life. So that when you separate yourself from true illuminated truth, you separate yourself from everything that you really want to know about yourself and about God and about your own emotionality, and about your own relationships. Right? Okay. Uh, I'm going to read the last two verses, and if you're just joining us, if you if you got to get off, I got uh, I do want to do the last two verses, and for those who just got on, I'm going to recap real quick the, uh, the first part of this and the first six verses, so just bear with me if you don't mind. Um, when, hey, Mitch and Jenny, what's up? When you come to the last two verses... And I, I almost, I wouldn't say I look at those separately from the psalm, but they are an addition that are very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Because having had, let's call it the 22 verses that we've been looking at, the conclusion of the 22 verses, he, and, I, and I'd like you to listen to me read this, okay? Because n now you know from the first six verses, and then verse 7 through 12, and then 17 and 18, what you didn't know before. I understand. If you got to get off, that's fine. Uh, but I want to get the last two verses and go back to the verse 6 for those who are just joining. Um, what he says at the end is this. Remember remember who he's asking. Remember everything, if you can. Remember some of what I told you in the first 22 verses. Who is he asking? Search me, the me that you created. Uh, one more time. I'm not sure if you're looking at a King James, New King James, NIV, English version, or whatever happens to be. Hey, Alicia Jones, what's up? Um, when he says, at verse 23, search me, he's not saying that in a sense that God who is out there, he's not trying to invoke God who has been distant from him to come and search him. He is invoking the presence of a God that he knows is there, who has made him, who knows everything about him, who knows wherever he's been, is completely invested in his life. And so when he says, search me, it's not like, come here and search me. It's you are here, close to me, search me. Does that make sense? If you just read 23, it might have the feeling that God was distanced. Please come and search me. You're far away. But that's not what he's saying. This is at the conclusion of a penetrating psalm that reads like an Old Testament sonogram. And the penetrating knowledge and the presence and the purpose and the love of God are on display fully. And at the end, knowing the nearness of God, knowing the presence of the living God, I want that God to search me, O oh God, and know my heart. What is the heart? Well, it's not just the... We tend to think... Even I, I understand the, the lack of theology here. We point to the heart. I got that. But when he talks about the heart, hey, Ruth, how are you? Love you, and I loved your husband, Curtis. And I hope you're listening. Ruth Atkins, I want you to know I love you, and I love your husband, Curtis, and I'm ready to cry. Yes, I am. I could just sit here and cry. Uh, I love Curtis Atkins. I went to Bible school with him. Oh, for 40. Oh, 40 years ago, you were my neighbors. And uh, he's gone to be with Jesus. And uh, he was a funny guy. Know my heart. Listen to the verbs. I've told you before, and I'm, I'm trying to make sure we're on the same page. I believe you meet with God between the commas. I want you to... I want you to sip these verbs and I want you to sip them slowly listen again to 23 search know test know 
He's not asking a God that he believes is far away and disconnected. He is invoking a God who he is near. He understands the nearness and the presence of God and he's trusting it. He so trusts the invasive, unapologetic presence, the permeating presence of the living God. He has such confidence in what God knows. He's able to effectively pray, search me, know my soul, my heart, the real me, verses 7 through 12. And then he says, test me and says, know my anxious thoughts. Do you remember, and I'll get to these if you're just joining us, know my anxious thoughts. He could have said fearful thoughts. He could have said angry thoughts. He could have, he could have characterized thoughts in any way that he wanted to, but he chose in this psalm to use the word anxious. The idea of anxiousness is the idea of being stirred up, like the Greek words better, actually. Uh, the sense of being stirred up. Matthew 6, when Jesus is speaking, I think he says six or seven times to not be anxious. Why? Th the whole thing about anxiety is it's rooted in a disconnect from God's sovereign approach, the, 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 his nearness. If you knew and I knew what God knows about his nearness in your life, you wouldn't be anxious. But we're human. And I'm not picking on you. I'm not faulting you. I'm just saying... Anxiety and worry and fear and bitterness, they are all signs of a lack of development. They're not stupid. When you are, when you are not quite developed, hi, Raleen, how are you? When your theology is not as developed as you think it is, what happens is your emotions go with it. So he says at the end of the psalm, See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In some sense, and I'm going to play with this just for a second and I'll come back to actually what it means. 24 doesn't make a lot of sense from a human point of view. If I said to you, hey, come here, I want you to learn all about me and find every disgusting thing that you can find about me, every re and I'm going to tell you every revolting thing about myself, every disgusting, putrid, nauseating, lousy part of Larry Douglas. And then after that, I want to spend time with you. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> right? I mean, if you say, if I said, hey, I'm going, to do a face, I'm, I'm going to do a Facebook feed, and for half an hour, 40 minutes, I'm going, to, I'm going to reveal every revolting thought and every revolting thing I've ever done. <laughs> you probably would watch out of a sheer freak show. But I doubt you'd want to spend much more time with me. But he does. He does. That is the way in which he knows the Lord. He has such confidence in the nearness and the grace and the glory of God that he has absolutely no fear because he knows what God already knows, and that's everything. God knows him completely. In fact, he doesn't say, God, I want you to show yourself. I want you to show me what you already see. No fig leaves. We are preoccupied with our own man-made, emotional, relational, financial, social fig leaves, and none of them work. None of them work. We we, we try to we try to dress up, pray nice, and pray different than we normally pray. And the guy, and I wonder what God thinks of all this. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Take off the fig leaf. I see through the fig leaf. Get rid of it. I know who you are. I know who I am. The profound thing is, is the last verb in the psalm, okay? The very last verb in the psalm is lead. I want you to think about something for a minute. I'm going to read you verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. Remember where we started? O Lord, search me and know me. Last phrase. Uh, 23. Search me, O Lord, and know me. The psalm ends right where it starts. And um, I think the comfort for us, if you're just joining us, and I am going to take a minute and go through these first six verses again if you're just joining us. That's what we're talking about. Is The 139th Psalm reads like an Old Testament sonogram. As like you were, you were carrying a child and they lay you on the table and they do that goop on the jelly and they show you whether the it's a male or a female, because that's all there is. <laughs> no matter what anybody else tells you, all the craziness that's going on. Males or females. 
and you are able to see on a screen with that wonderful bit of technology. The 139th Psalm does the same thing. It reads like an Old Testament sonogram. Uh, I do want to go through the first six verses again for those of you who joined us late, and I'm, I'm going to be very brief with this, because I want you to know that there is wonderful, wonderful emotional healing in this, just wonderful emotional healing in these first six verses. Oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit, and when I rise. You perceive. You discern my going out, and, all my, and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me to attain. I'll stop here. There is a sense in which one of God's attributes is his omniscience. He knows everything. And we kind of know that about him as Christians. What we do not always know is that he did not learn in the sense that we learn. He is omniscient because he has always been. He is eternal. He changes not. He is immutable. God has always been omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. But these six verses focus on the omniscience of God. And they focus on the fact that he is known. David knows that he is known by God, which tells you God wants to know him. But God knows the David that God created, not the David that David sometimes tried to create himself. And he knows you, not the you that you are trying to create to please parents, which may be okay sometimes, trying to please work people, which may be okay sometimes, or please yourself, which may be okay sometimes, but sometimes there are things in life, and what happens because we don't know who we are, we acclimate ourselves to the thing that we think we should be. And what the Lord wants to do is the Lord wants to teach you and me who he made us to be because that's the person that he knows. We introduce a stranger in the sense of trying to be someone to impress people at work, at church, wherever ourselves fit in. Uh, we simply cannot divorce ourselves as people. We love celebrity. We are addicted to celebrity, not so much to service. And what I want to close with here is the fact that you are known because God wants to know you, but he created a you that he wants you to know. And in verse 5, 6 says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's hard to attain. He said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he said in verse 14, I praise you. The praise is a praise of self-revelation, the learning of who I am, that didn't stop it, narcissism or pride or vanity. It is, it is a recognition that your existence is mine, is an act of God, a creative act of God that should result in our worship. As you learn who you are, it should result in your thanking God for who you are and not self-punishment, not depression, not self-abuse, not self-criticism, not self-loathing. As you learn yourself, you should be thankful for that. Yes, we struggle for sin, but that's not what I was talking about tonight. And I could have got into all that, but it would have been a longer a longer discussion here. And that's for another night. And I hope you're not disappointed that I didn't get into you know, non-posse, non-picard, not able not to sin. I could have done that. But I wanted to focus on something positive tonight, and I appreciate your time. I hope this has been helpful to you. If you think it is, uh, pass it along. I love you all. I see your names, and I, you know what? Hang on. Nancy, you, Ruth, Raylene, Alicia, I just love you guys. Mitch, Jenny, Jean, Drake, I just love you guys. Connie, Hope, Sarah Jenkins, how's the babies? Hope you're doing okay. Hope everybody's healthy. Linda, all the rest of you, there's a bunch of names here. I'm scrolling through, and uh, I'm glad you could be here. Hope, Sarah, hope you're doing well. Jefferson, Jesperies, how are you? And so, hope you're doing well. I might, uh, I'm going to be preaching on Sunday morning if you're around uh, Waynesburg Bible Chapel. I am going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 17, what to do when the brook dries up, and some practicalities that are found in the first six verses and then in, in the following six verses there. So if you can, be there. Join us, Waynesburg Bible Chapel. And love you much, and I'll talk to you later. See you.